And there are five I'll make mention of. First of all, Paul himself is on display here. He's the one writing. He's the one who is describing the effort. He is also the one, as it becomes evident, who is directing the effort. And his role is an apostolic role. He is an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he has an authority that this church is to respect and is on display in this coordinated effort. He is the one who has appealed to Titus to go to them. He says that in verse 17, for he not only accepted our appeal, but being himself very earnest, he's going to you of his own accord. So Paul appealed to him to do this. He is the one who is sending those along who will assist Titus and represent the churches. Verse 18, with him we are sending the brother who is famous among all the churches for his preaching of the gospel. Verse 22, and with them we are sending our brother whom we have often tested and found earnest in many matters, but who is now more earnest than ever because of his great confidence in you. So Paul is directing this, sending these brothers along with Titus. Paul also makes clear that he will be overseeing the administration of this gift, this generous gift. He says in verse 19, and not only that, but he has been appointed by the churches to travel with us as we carry out this act of grace that is being ministered or administrated, same word that's used a few verses more, being ministered by us for the glory of the Lord himself and to show our good will. Next verse, we take this course that no one should blame us about this generous gift that is being administered by us. So Paul oversees this, he's administrating this, he appeals to Titus to go, he sends these brothers who go along with Titus, and Paul is exhorting the Corinthian church in verse 24 to follow suit. Verse 24, so give proof before the churches of your love and of our boasting about you to these men. So Paul, we see in these verses. Also on display in the verses is Titus. As we saw in verse 17, Paul asked Titus to assume a leadership role in this effort. Titus is an apostolic representative. Titus is described by Paul in verse 23 as his partner and his fellow worker for their benefit. That, he, he distinguishes Titus from the other brothers. The brothers are described as representative of the churches. Titus is being described as a representative of Paul. Paul appeals to him. Titus accepts Paul's appeal so that Titus, Titus is not just responding to Paul. Notice he, he is responding to God's grace, verse 16. Thanks be to God who put into the heart of Titus the same earnest care I have for you. For he not only accepted our appeal, but being himself very earnest, he's going to you of his own accord. And so Titus is a man who has proven very faithful in a partnership with Paul, a fellow servant with Paul, and he is going to represent Paul as uh, this travel group makes their way to the Corinthian church. Titus is on display here. A third person is on display, a brother who is famous for the preaching of the gospel. Verse 18, with him we are sending the brother who is famous among all the churches for his preaching of the gospel. You say, who is that? I say, I do not know. It does not tell us. His name is not given. We don't know who this brother was. What we do know is he has already become somewhat famous among the churches. And it is for the ministry of preaching. He preaches the gospel faithfully. He also has the confidence of the churches because he is one of two men mentioned here who were appointed by the churches to accompany Titus and to make sure that the administration of this generous gift was going to be above reproach. He's a faithful man. And I think it is instructive, don't you, that a man who would be famous for preaching would also be involved on this occasion in a mercy ministry. That's not to say that perhaps he did not preach as they traveled about to the churches or didn't preach in some of the cities where they went, but on this occasion, what he is engaged in is not the ministry of preaching so much as the ministry of extending mercy to a congregation of the Lord. In other words, his ministry was not just limited to one thing, and that should be true of us also. 
A fourth person is mentioned, a brother who has been tested and found earnest. Verse 22, and with them we are sending our brother whom we have often tested and found earnest in many matters. You may want to just circle in your mind those words often tested and those words many matters. He has been often tested. He has been found earnest in many different things but who is now more earnest than ever because of his great confidence in you. This is a brother known for his earnestness, famous for his sincerity and his zeal, famous for the fact that he's a proven servant. He's been tested in many matters. Now, if you've been tested in many matters and you've been proven in many matters, that means you have made yourself available in many matters. This is a man who has proven he is at the disposal of those who need him. This is a willing servant. This is a zealous servant. And I think it's instructive that when Paul is writing this to the Corinthians, he has no need to use their names. I mean, these are men who are not mentioned by name, and yet Paul assumes that this church is going to know who it is he's talking about. It says that these men were known more for their character and more for their service than even for their names. That's a good challenge for us, isn't it? If tonight I did not use your name, but I simply described what you do in this church, would people know who I'm talking about? We want to serve in such a way, do we not, that people would be able to recognize our love for Christ and our love for His church by our service to Christ on behalf of His church. And that's what characterized these two men we just mentioned. And then there's a fifth group we can mention. Again, the names are not here, but you, you know that this generous gift, this generous offering had to come from somebody. And so you have all of the unnamed, faceless saints of God in all of these churches who have been giving to help the poor Christians in Jerusalem. That's what's going to be administrated. That's what's going to be managed, this, this generous gift that has come from churches, that has come from, when we say from churches, we're saying from Christians, has come from individual believers who have sacrificed to meet a need. As we saw with the Macedonian believers, many of these people had not only been willing to give their money, but to give of themselves in any way possible to help someone else. Just as these two unnamed brothers are not known to us by name, but known to God forever for their faithful service, so these unnamed Christians who gave this generous gift are not forgotten by their God. Now, Paul, Titus, the brother famous for preaching, the, the brother who has proven in many matters, and all of the saints who gave to this offering, what do we see in them? What do we see in this scene of cooperative ministry that should speak to us tonight about our ministry right here? When we mine this passage for the characteristics, the descriptions of faithful servants, what do we see? And I want to just share nine that stand out. Probably could have broken these out into more, but for the sake of clarity and being succinct, I, I, I boiled it down to nine. Not exhaustive. You, you, I'm sure, could point out some others. But let me share the nine that stand out as I look at the text. The first one, the overarching one, the one that is chief in all faithful manifestations of the grace of God would be love. What stands out about all of these people is love. And we can begin with Paul. Paul loved the churches. And he specifically loved, in this case, the Corinthian church. His correction has come from the place of love. His self-defense has come from the place of love. His exhortation here to finish their offering comes from the place of love. They, they doubted that sometimes. They wondered about it sometimes. And even though his love is on display throughout this letter, when we get to the end of the letter, he's just going to come out and confess it. And he's going to address their doubts about it 
as he confesses it. Look over to chapter 11 real quickly if you want. Just spin to the right there. And when you get to the 10th verse, Paul says, As the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine will not be silenced in the regions of Achaia. And why? Because I do not love you. What does he say? God knows I do. We'll talk, talk more about that boasting in a moment. It had to do with how he carried out ministry to these people. He says, what I glory in is not because I haven't loved you. It's because I do love you. And then in chapter 12, verse 15, he wrote, I will most gladly spend and be spent for your souls. And then he says, if I love you more, am I to be loved less? I mean, Paul is still sensing that, in, at least in some in the Corinthian church, there's still this barrier. There's still this, this problem that exists. And that's why he continues to address it throughout the letter. There's been improvement. There's been repentance. But he knows it doesn't mean every pocket of resistance is gone. And so once again, he's saying, listen, I do love you. Love me back. Love me in return. But we see that Paul is not alone in his love for the church. It is God's work in the heart of Titus that explains Titus's willingness to accept Paul's appeal. And in fact, Paul describes Titus in verse 16 as having the same earnest care for this church that Paul has for them. He loves them like Paul loves them. In fact, Paul says in verse 17, he's going of his own accord. And the brothers have a care for the churches. They go as representatives of the churches. And in verse 22, talking about that, that earnest brother, it says of him, and with them we are sending our brother whom we've often tested and found earnest in many matters, but who is now more earnest than ever because of his great confidence in you. You see, this brother has a special care for this church, an earnest concern and confidence when it comes to the Corinthian congregation. We are reminded that we never serve genuinely we never serve faithfully unless we can say that our service is being offered through love. Genuine service is a love act. We serve as Christ would have us serve when we serve because we love Jesus and we serve because we love the people of Jesus. We love our brothers and sisters. That's how we are meant to serve. Galatians 5.13 says, For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Through love. Can I ask you tonight, whatever service it is you offer to the Lord in this church, are you offering it through love? Does love motivate it? Does love explain it? Is love the measure for it? Is love present in it? and being reflected in it? It should be. And what is Paul exhorting the Corinthians to in verse 24? He says, so give proof before the churches of your love. He's calling for the Corinthian church to love as these churches need to see. He's boasted about this congregation. Now let it be proven true as the churches see your love. So the first quality that stands out is that of love. The second quality that stands out, we would describe as zeal. Faithful service is zealous service. Zeal in the sense that it is sincere. Zeal in the sense that it comes from the heart. Zeal in that it is genuine and it is diligent. It is not just paying lip service. L love is more than words. Love is more than sentiment. Love is more than a feeling you have and attitudes that you express in words. I'm not saying that, that words can't be genuine and genuinely express love. They certainly can, and they're needed. But love is willing to act. Love is willing to get involved. Love is willing to move. Love serves. Love is zealous for its object. Love really cares. Cares in a way that it's willing to get involved. Richard, where do you get this idea of zeal from? Well, notice four times. 
four times, Paul emphasizes earnestness. Verse 16, God has put into the heart of Titus the same earnest care I have for you. You look at Paul, you see earnestness. You look at Titus, you see earnestness. Verse 17, for he not only accepted our appeal, but being himself very earnest, he is going to you of his own accord. And then you talk about the unnamed brothers when you get to verse 22. We see it twice again. And with them we are sending our brother, whom we have often tested and found earnest in many matters. If you see the word diligent there, if you have the New American Standard, it's the same Greek word that's used for earnest back up in verse 17. It doesn't change. And that same word is used again in verse 22 where it says, but who is now more earnest than ever because of his great confidence in you. Paul is earnest. Titus is earnest. The brothers are earnest. And the word just simply means genuine care, sincere diligence. Faithful service to Christ is going to mean that we invest ourselves in other people. We commit ourselves to a people. We're going to give of ourselves to a people. We're going to care about the people whom we serve. Is your service sort of nameless and faceless in the sense that you're just carrying out a set of duties? Or do you actually see the people in front of you? whom you're serving and do you love them do you care for them and are you willing to spend and be spent for them is there zeal in your service you know this is what's to characterize elders they're not to do what they do out of a sense of duty but because they want to because they desire to serving the church is not eight to five punch a clock you're in and you're out serving the church is loving the church and loving the church means you you get tired along the way of service because, because you're willing to be used up for the sake of Christ and the gospel and his people. Third quality that stands out as you look at these verses is cooperation. Love, zeal, third, cooperation. I don't think I have to spend a lot of time convincing, convincing you of that quality from these verses because it's all over the verses. Paul, Titus, the brothers, the churches, what are they doing? They're all cooperating together to meet a need. Multiple believers taking part in a coordinated effort, all working together for the glory of God, verse 21, and the good of other people. Paul says in verse 19, he does what he does. For the glory of the Lord himself and to show our good will. Verse 21, he says, for we aim at what is honorable, not only in the sight of the Lord, the Lord's sight, but also in the sight of man. For the glory of God, for the good of other people. This is what they're cooperating for. Now, I want to exhort you not to just pass by that quickly. Don't underestimate that. That is a simple quality, but sadly, it is often a lacking quality. That is the ability to work for Christ with other people. There are many people who struggle with this. They have a hard time assuming a role on a team. Independent in nature. And this can be on, on either end of the spectrum. You talk about someone who is given a leadership responsibility or you're talking about someone who is given a followership responsibility. People struggle here. On the followership side, people sometimes resent anyone telling them what to do, anyone directing their course, anyone giving them instructions. You have people who, who tend to operate as lone rangers. They just don't want anyone else directing them. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have people that you can't give responsibility to because they don't trust anyone under their care. They don't release any kind of responsibility. They don't allow others to serve with their gifts and their abilities. Or they don't want to be bothered with having to worry about someone else. So just let me operate in my own little area over here. Please don't give me much responsibility because I really don't want to be weighed down with having to concern myself with how someone else is doing under my care. Either way, what are you not doing? You're not cooperating. You will not serve well. You will not serve the Lord Jesus well if you cannot serve with others. The very way that the Spirit of God 
has distributed gifts tells us that God means for the church to be a cooperative ministry body. Each one of us has been given a spiritual gift. Our gifts are as different as we are, and yet we fit together in such a way that together the work of the ministry gets done. So I ask you to examine yourself this evening. Are you a cooperative servant? Do you serve well with others? Can you assume a role in which someone else is going to be directing you? And or can you assume a role where you're going to watch over someone else and help them as they progress in their service for Christ and shepherd them and and enable them to to grow and to be successful? And do you do you find yourself willing to, to let loose of some things to allow others to learn to do ministry? It's a real test for us, but it's on display in these verses, isn't it? Love, zeal, cooperation. Fourth quality that stands out, runs through everything I've talked about so far, is the quality of humility. You cannot have cooperation among people unless you have humble hearts. You can't have a distribution of responsibilities. You can't have an administration of those responsibilities unless you have a people willing to humble themselves and assume the roles that they are assigned. That takes a humble heart. You say, where is humility on display in our verses? Well, multiple ways. One, Paul is clearly in the leadership role. He is an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't it interesting, though, in verse 17, he describes Titus' willingness to go to Corinth as a response to an appeal. Not a command, not a demand, but an appeal. And he actually rejoices in God's work in Titus' heart that Titus would accept such an appeal. So even as Paul is in a position of authority, he carries out that work with humility. And Titus is clearly his right-hand man. As I said earlier, he distinguishes Titus from the other brothers and that Titus is his partner, his fellow worker. The other brothers are described as messengers of the churches. And yet Titus accepts Paul's appeal and is full of zeal for the church and demonstrates the love of Christ. He's a humble man also. You have two men who are serving well. They're not even identified by name. Yet they've proven themselves faithful in the preaching of the gospel and in the handling of matters that have been assigned to them as they've been tested on many occasions. You have a whole host of people making the work of the ministry possible in this case. We don't know their names. They just give. They give and they pray and they have a role in appointing messengers who will administrate this gift. But they also trust those messengers, which speaks of their humility. Paul takes precautions to make sure that the work is above reproach. That's humility. He understands the dangers associated with administrating money, verse 20 and 21. And he says, we take this course so that no one should blame us about the generous gift that's being administered by us. He could have been proud about this and stubborn and said, well, people should just trust us. But he doesn't do that. He takes necessary steps to make sure that what he's doing is clearly trustworthy. That's humility. And something that constantly stands out to me about the Apostle Paul is his joy in praising other people. Do you notice that? How often in all of Paul's letters he is praising someone else? He is recognizing someone's godly character or he's recognizing someone's faithful service or he's recognizing someone's sacrificial love. He's recognizing how someone, for example, is, was maybe near death, but now they've recovered and oh, how the Lord has blessed us all that they are well again. And that sort of thing you see in Paul over and over again. And do you know that's a, a, a clear sign of a humble heart? Someone who struggles to give credit to others, someone who struggles to praise other people, someone who struggles to rejoice in and to recognize the good work of God in someone else's life as someone who has a proud heart. And all of these people are described in humble terms when they are described as people who have one aim, to glorify God and to be used by God for the good of others. 
Paul says they're administering the gift for the glory of the Lord himself and to show our goodwill, verse 19. We aim, verse 21, at what is honorable, not only in the, in the Lord's sight, but also in the sight of man. I want to do what's right in God's sight and what's right before everybody else's sight also. This is a humble man. These are humble servants. And wherever you have humility, you have an ability to be submissive. Wherever you have humility, you have, an abil- you have the desire to be a faithful representative These men are representing the churches. They want to be faithful not only to God in that, they want to be faithful to the churches. You cannot serve well if you're not walking in humility. You can't serve well unless you can say that your aim is the glory of God and the good of others. You can't serve well if you can't be submissive to other people. In fact, you can't serve well if you can't work. Listen, if you can't work to achieve someone else's desires, One of the things I'm I'm so thankful for having my dad come to faith in Christ and the influence that he had on my life after he came to Jesus. And one of the things that I was glad my, my father passed on to me was the ability to submit your desires to someone else's desires and then to actually work to see what someone else wants done accomplished. I think that's a good quality to learn. Do you work for someone else's success? Do you work for someone else to achieve things that, because they're in a position of authority over you, it's their desire, and so you work as if it's your desire. In fact, it becomes your desire to see those desires accomplished. You'll never know that if you don't have a humble spirit. So love, zeal, cooperation, humility... Fifth, I've already noted it. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but it is good, I think, to break it out separate. Integrity. Faithful service will have integrity. That's what Paul is talking about in verse 19 and 20 and 21. Doing this in a way that is above reproach. Doing this in a way that is clearly above reproach and faithful. That's his desire, that's his practice. And not just Paul's, but as we saw already, there is that brother who is noted for having been often tested and found earnest in many matters. He has proven faithful. His service has integrity. It's been tested, and it's passed the test. And so it is a man with integrity who is being sent by the churches. The churches can trust these men. That's why they send these men. Are you trustworthy? Can someone take important matters and give them into your hands and know that by the grace of God, those things are safe? That you will strive with all your energy as the Lord supplies strength to make sure that you carry out that responsibility in a way that glorifies God and is right even before men. Are you that kind of servant? Do you know what will, tear, what will wear someone out who's in leadership as much as anything? It's when they are giving responsibilities to people who fa- fail to follow through. Here is this. Would you take care of this? I am on it. I've got it. It's safe. You check back in two weeks, and it's not safe. It has fallen through the cracks. It has not been accomplished. We don't want to be that kind of people, do we? We want to be a people who can be trusted. And Paul was conducting the ministry in a way that it was trustworthy. Sixth quality that stands out, runs through all of this, is wisdom. To be faithful in ministry, we we need wisdom from God. You don't have a rule book for everything you have to do in ministry. You don't have a a, a blueprint. You have the Word of God. It is absolutely sufficient, but then it has to be applied skillfully. You're going to come face to face with situations where the Bible doesn't say exactly what you're to do in that situation. And so you have to know what it is to take the Word of God and plug it into that situation. And for that, you need the Lord Himself. For that, you need the leadership of the Holy Spirit. 
the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit, the wisdom that comes from God. I wonder why Paul was so careful with this money issue. One reason, I think, is that he had already come face to face with how Satan likes to distort reality. He has seen that in his relationship with the Corinthian church. These false teachers have had their influence. Satan has distorted reality through those false teachers. He wants to take precautions to make sure that doesn't happen with this. In fact, if you'll look down to chapter 11 for a moment, look at verse 7. We have an example of what I'm talking about. Paul is still having to defend himself about something that's sort of strange. That is, why didn't he take money from the Corinthians as he ministered there with them? Verse 7, he says, Or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted because I preached God's gospel to you free of charge? Remember they were saying Paul was crafty? Yeah, he came at first for no money, but now watch out. He's about to take advantage of you. I mean, this is the sort of thing the false teachers were saying. He's interested in this offering. It's true he didn't come for money at first, but that was just a way to get his foot in the door. Just watch out. Verse 8, I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. And when I was with you and was in need, I did not burden anyone. For the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. Interesting. Some people try to take Paul's words and turn this into sort of a standard that if you really love the Lord, really love the churches, you'll never receive support for ministry, financial support. Well, right here, Paul tells you he was receiving support, just not from the Corinthians. He understood there was a special precaution that was needed. He says, so I refrained and will refrain from burdening you in any way. As the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine will not be silenced in the regions of Achaia. And why? Because I do not love you. God knows I do. And what I do, I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission, they work on the same terms as we do. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ, And on he goes. And so he's saying, look, I'm taking these steps to silence them. What is this? This is wisdom at work. And you see Paul's wisdom at work in other ways. Look back to chapter 2, if you would. Look at verse 9 of chapter 2. Now encouraging the Corinthians to forgive the one who had sinned and repented. He says, for this is why I wrote that I might test you. This is verse 9 of chapter 2. And know whether you are obedient in everything. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. What I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ so that we would not be outwitted by Satan. For we are not ignorant of his designs. We're not ignorant of how he works. This man not only had integrity and humility, he had wisdom. He had wisdom. He understood things he needed to be careful about in the realm of ministry. Another example in another book is the book of Philippians. Pastor Philip read from it earlier, the fourth chapter, just above where he read. Do you remember the encouragement he gave to two women in the church who were having a dispute with each other? Chapter 4, verse 2, he says, I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. I entreat you, Euodia and Syntyche, to agree in the Lord. You ladies need to get along. And he says to his true companion, help these ladies. Help them get along. Why is it so important? Because Paul is not ignorant of the devil's schemes. Look back at our text, if you would. And so when you see Paul setting forth the way this offering is going to go, he's going to send Titus, he's going to send representatives from the churches, they're going to administrate this gift in a way that nobody can question what is going on. This is wisdom. This is wisdom at work. And so I would ask you, do you ask the Lord for wisdom? Your area of ministry, where you serve, 
We could be talking tonight about the ministry in your home, raising your children. Do you ask God for wisdom to make choices that are sound, God-glorifying, good for the people that you're serving? And do you seek wisdom? You, you do know, as you ask God for wisdom, He often supplies that wisdom, making use of the means of other people. I mean, there's wisdom in a multitude of counselors. And so when you gather to yourself men and women who have walked with God and know the Scriptures and have experience, that's a wise thing to do, to learn to be a listener, to learn to be a learner. Wisdom on display in our verses. Seventh, we see proven faithfulness. Proven faithfulness. This brother in verse 22 has been tested in many matters. He's being sent. Why? He's a faithful man. Titus, a fellow co-worker with Paul. He's a faithful man. And this is what he's looking for in the Corinthians also in verse 24, right? Give proof, give evidence before the churches of your love. Prove what I'm boasting about in you. Prove yourselves faithful. What a lovely word that is. What a treasured quality that is. When I get on my knees each day and give thanks to God, a thanks related to this church, I thank God constantly for faithful people. And people who are not just have not just been faithful short term, but have been faithful for years. Proven servants that we have in this congregation, faithful men and women. What a gift from God. We give Him praise. That's what I want to be characterized by, and that's what you should want to be characterized by. Lord, make me a faithful man. Make me a faithful woman. Make me a faithful servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. What is faithfulness? Faithfulness is not seeking success. Faithfulness is when you seek to please God in all your ways. That's faithfulness. You, you've, you know this. We've said this many times. We don't build the church. The Lord Jesus builds the church. We just want to be faithful with the Word of God and faithful in loving His people and faithful in the things He's called us to be faithful in. So we're not striving for success. We're striving to please God in all of our ways. I exhort you to think that way about every area where you have responsibility. Sometimes it's so easy to get focused on the outcome instead of focusing on faithfulness in the midst of the steps that God will use to produce an outcome. Just focus on being faithful. These were faithful people. Eighth, we notice God glorifying motives. God glorifying motives. I know I've mentioned it more than once, but I, I wanted to break it out separate and underscore it. Are you allowing the Lord to purify your motives? Right? Why do you do what you do? Why do you teach that Sunday school class? Why do you serve in the music ministry? Why do you preach a sermon? Why do you take the time to counsel someone? Why do you give your gift at the offering time? Why do you open up the buildings? Why do you usher in the parking lot? Why do you come to church? Why do you do what you do? We want to be able to say what Paul said. He does what he does for the glory of the Lord himself. He aims at what is honorable in the sight of the Lord. And... He wanted to show his goodwill. He loves people. He wants to be used by God to serve God's people. And so would you ask the Lord, if you want to be a faithful servant, would you ask the Lord to purify your motives? Lord, help me not only to do the right things, but the right things for the right reasons and in the right way. God glorifying motives. Love Zeal, cooperation, humility, integrity, wisdom, proven faithfulness, God-glorifying motives. Last one. 
Throughout these verses, we see exhortation, encouragement. Do you ever need encouragement? Do you think other people need encouragement besides just you? One of the great qualities of a faithful servant of Jesus Christ is that coming through their lives is an encouragement for for faithful servants. May the Lord make us encouragers by nature, exhorters. In fact, you do know this. One of the reasons we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together is because we're to be doing what? Exhorting one another all the more as we see the day approaching. We gather for exhortation. You can get weary along the journey of serving Jesus Christ. You can get discouraged. You can become doubtful. And how much of a blessing is it when, you, when someone speaks the, those fitting words to you at just the right time and it lifts your spirit? Someone puts an arm around you and they recognize what you're doing for Christ. That's what Paul's doing. When he mentions Titus the way that he does, listen, that had to encourage the heart of Titus. When he mentions the faithfulness of these unnamed brothers, how it must have encouraged their hearts. And as he exhorts the Corinthian church in verse 24, and this letter is full of exhortations. This would benefit them if they embrace it and receive it. One of the things I've prayed throughout the years is, Lord, would you make me an encouragement to godly people? You know, we're either going to embolden people who don't love the Lord, or may the Lord use us to embolden people who do love Him. And so when we think about, for example, even being courageous with just saying what the Scriptures say, you know, there's a risk in that, but the blessing of it is people who love God long for someone who will tell the truth in the midst of a world full of lies. Oh, Lord, is there a place where I can find the truth? Well, the church is the pillar in support of the truth. And so as we preach the Scriptures, we, it's a word of exhortation. We're encouraging the hearts of godly people. May my life be an encouragement to godly people. May my words be an encouragement to godly people. May my example never embolden the wicked, but may it embolden people who love Jesus Christ. My dad was an exhorter. I think it was his predominant, the predominant color that showed up in his gift. He was just an exhorter. And it was amazing. You would see sometimes exhortation, even in correction. I had a young friend when I was young, James Pierce, ended up in the ministry pastoring churches for many, many years. But I can remember James sitting down with my dad looking for some wisdom. And my mother would listen as my father would sometimes have to get on James a little bit. James suffered, he would tell you this if he were were sitting here, he suffered with, with some fearfulness cautiousness and my father would would get on James a bit and say now James you're going to have to be stronger son and this is what you're going to have to do and it was like he was beating him up and then James would walk out and say thank you for that my mother would like what thank you for that what do you mean thank you for that who would thank someone for that but you know what was what was interesting is even his correction had had this sense about it by the grace of God by the spirit of God to encourage someone to exhort someone Sometimes people need exhortation by being lifted up. Sometimes they need exhortation by being corrected. But in every way, our desire should be, Lord, would you help me help someone else continue along the way? Help me help someone else believe you, trust you, obey you, repent before you, serve you well. Lord, strengthen us to be a church full of encouraging people. Well, we see the description of people serving together in those first churches. Some of the people aren't even named, but the hand of God is all over it. And what emerges out of that description are these qualities, these manifestations of grace. And may our service embody these same qualities.
May the love of God and the earnestness taught by the Spirit of God and the humility that allows us to cooperate with each other and to take a role on a team and be submissive and serve faithfully and with integrity. May the Lord produce wisdom, faithfulness, God-glorifying motives. May we encourage each other until the day because that day's closer today than it's ever been. And may the Lord strengthen us to finish well. And the church would say, amen. amen. Let's pray. Lord, it is encouraging to see your work in the lives of your people on the pages of Scripture. It is convicting to us, but Lord, it's also encouraging to us. We need each other. Lord, we need you. We are desperate for you each day, but Lord, you have also designed our walk with you in such a way that you mean for us to need each other. And so I pray that we would not be isolated from our brothers and sisters, but our lives would be interwoven in such a way that we would be able to benefit each other. Help us, Lord, to be faithful in our service to you aim at pleasing you in all of our ways. And through this, may you put yourself on display. May the truth about you be gloriously on display in and through what is the glory of Christ, his church. And we ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.